Okay. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Pushing the Limits. Today, I have a friend, an ultra running friend, who just happens to be one of the, well, I think the most leading longevity scientist in the world, Bill Andrews. Welcome to the show, Dr. Bill. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. We did it six years ago. I'm glad to be back on your show again. Now, really, really exciting. Um, so, Bill, let's tell the people a little bit about our backstory and why, why you know, we, we, how do I know such a famous person? Um, <laughs> you have a wonderful wife, Molly. Shout out to Molly. And Molly and I are, are friends from way back doing ultra marathons in the Himalayas. Thanks to you, actually. Um, I went over there, <laughs> you and Molly. Right, um, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So you you did a race in the Himalayas, and you're a crazy ultra marathon runner. Tell us about um, La Ultra and doing that that race over there a little bit. Well, I've been I've been running. I, I'm just a fanatic. I've been running my whole life. I I guess I did my first ultra marathon in 1997, <clears throat> and then no, and sorry, 1996 at the end of 1996, and then 1997. I just got so obsessed. I ran 50 mile races like almost once a week. Then later found out I broke a world record for the most 50 mile races run in one year. Uh, so the, the next year I started running 100 mile races. And then at the end of that year, I found out I know I broke the record for that too. <laughs> most mile races running one year. I just obsessed with, it was too much fun. You know, I just, I just think ultra marathon, right? If you, if you do it slow and have fun, uh don't 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 be somebody who's <clears throat> crossing finish lines on your hands and knees throwing up it's really it's really good for you uh but uh i just got really obsessed with i wanted to do all the adventure ones i i so the thing that drives me is the adventure so mm. um <clears throat> now i met my wife I met her at a race and she was very interested in getting into ultras and then she just blew the field away she i i, I felt like i was her mentor at first <laughs> she, she just got into it so much that she just took over she 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 ran a lot of the races that i did uh like the bad water race which is a uh torturous race at yeah it was fun <laughs> yeah you you've done it too that's right yeah yeah a <laughs> couple yeah. of times but uh, then she got this letter from a guy in india it's saying that he's got his name is Rajet Chalcon, but he said he was developing a race that the Indian government said was impossible. Okay. And that was a race that was going to run over an 18,000 foot peak. And I, you know, I converting into kilometers is not by best thing, but I think that's about 5,000. Yeah. So it was 5,700 meters roughly. Roughly, okay. yeah. So, uh, and the lowest point of the race was going to be eleven thousand feet. Yep, uh, three six. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and <clears throat> he said, he said, "Would you like to be in the race?" And she says, "Oh yes, absolutely. I don't want. I couldn't possibly miss this." <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> so he invited a whole bunch of other people, and they all said no. But she told me about the race, and I said, "Oh, I want to do it too." So <clears throat> for a while. She and I were the only people in the world that had agreed to sign up for this race. Nobody had ever done it. Uh, in gov Indian government said it was impossible. Then a third person signed up. Oh, Mark. <laughs> you know, Mark Cobain in England. Uh, and so on. The, so we all went there. Uh, on day one, the starting, starting the race, there was only three people at the starting line. Me, Molly, and Mark. <clears throat> And I'll tell you, it was the most adventuresome thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Molly and I had a commitment ceremony at the eighteen thousand foot. Oh, I forgot to. <laughs> after we signed up, uh, Rajet <clears throat> made the course tougher by including a second eighteen thousand foot peak. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget the second one that nearly killed me. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so, but on the first one, Molly and I had this commitment ceremony. Uh, which was really great. And plus there was a documentary film crew going along that was filming it all. And they, they got included that. So 
<clears throat> I think you're in a documentary too. Huh? Yeah, 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 I have. I have made cool. a doco on it. It was I did it the following year. I did it a year after you guys did it the first time. And then Molly came back and ran it again with me. And because you, yeah, you, you both had some medical adventures on the, on the first time. <laughs> so you went back well, afterwards and did it. I came again. back the following year and finished yeah. it. Yeah. So I, yeah. I ended up having a gallbladder attack at 50 <laughs> miles. So after I'd already gone over the first 18,000 foot peak, I had oh. a gallbladder attack. They put it, took me to the hospital. I had to be airlifted or to, Delhi, where I spent two weeks, and my doctors here wouldn't let me do the surgery, so they flew me here, and I had the surgery done here. But <laughs> Molly didn't find out that I was having this trouble until she was over 100 miles into the race, just climbing the second peak, when the race director told her, <clears throat> and she dropped. She yeah. just she well, as you would continue knowing that I was in this trouble. She. They didn't know at the time what was wrong with me. She was afraid it was altitude sickness. And she had already been in the hospital because her crew lost her. She got dehydrated. They had to go to the hospital. <clears throat> and the guy in the hospital bed next to her died from altitude sickness. Yeah, so she, it was that serious, guys. <laughs> yeah, so she she uh, she couldn't go on with the race. She was afraid I had altitude sickness. So she dropped from the race, and she and I flew to Delhi together. And that's where I was diagnosed with having a gallbladder talk, not, not, uh, not altitude. altitude. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and this was, I mean, this was extreme. I mean, the following year, Molly came back and, and we ran it together and, you know, it was hell. Like I, I really struggled with that race. <laughs> oh, I've done a lot, but um, that one was pretty tough. There, there wouldn't have been a second race if Mark Cobain had no, not. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And someone did a, it. And there was a the documentary has him being interviewed. He 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 thought he was gonna die. Yeah, he literally thought he was gonna die. This was wrong. He said, This is gonna die. And but you know, it it's a tough, very tough race. But I'll tell you, I'm sure glad that Molly went back and finished it. Then I went back and finished it. Uh and uh we both had that on our record. I'm still the oldest person to ever have finished it. Wow, and I, and I was the uh, second woman to fin cross the finish line. Sharon Gator beat beat me on that year. I was trying to be the first, right? And Molly was not far behind me. <laughs> Molly was the first American woman. Yeah, okay. I was the first Kiwi. <laughs> but it yeah. was it was one hell of an adventure. Not one I particularly want to repeat because I did I did struggle. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait to go back. I wish I, I I'm upset they terminated the race, but I just been so busy. I haven't had a chance to go back. Yeah, there's, so, there's too much to do in this world too and then that brings us to the topic of today because uh yeah yeah bill is this the most amazing ultra marathon runner and bill is 71 years old and still I running think, ultras think, 72 now oh karaki and and you were going to be setting a record in october did you do that record no just be it was uh october so not last october but the october before yeah uh and uh, uh the weather report said blizzards during the con uh, and, and, you know, the goal was to go break a world record yeah not just through the race and it was going to be a flat very boring race no hills no adventure it was but at least it wasn't 400 times around a track yeah <laughs> it was be a, a flat race that was like i think 12 and a half miles out turn around come back 12 and a half miles out the other direction come back that'd be 50 miles and then do that twice wow. okay when, when I heard that there was going to be a blizzard, I decided, no, there's no way I'm going to break the world record during the blizzard. Yeah. And so I canceled. And I thought I'd do it next year. And yeah. I broke my arm. Then I broke my arm two <laughs> weeks before the race. And so I've, I've missed it twice now. But uh, you have to do it. Both years. You you have to do it for the eighty year olds when you when you get to eighty do the world record for the eighty year olds doing it. 10, 80, 10, 100. I'm planning on breaking all those records. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that brings us to the topic of today. So Dr. Bill is uh he he is an, an inventor of the year in in 1997, I believe. Um, you're the discoverer of telomerase, which is a enzyme that lengthens telomeres. He's a telomere scientist. We're going to be talking today about longevity, telomeres, gene therapies, all of that sort of stuff. Doctor Bill, can you give us a little bit of a brief background on you know you've been in the longevity space forever since you were a kid. 
your dad put you onto this basically from the age of 10 or something silly. Yeah. Um, how, how did you get here and, and what are you, you know, what are you most known for? Uh, well, I got here because my father put the seed in my head, which I think we discussed at my last interview. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, and my father was essentially my partner in all this until he passed away from Alzheimer's in 2015. But um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I, I just, I, I was obsessed all through high school, college, everything about aging. And I, none of the theories made sense. I, I studied a lot of evolution what evolutionary biologists were saying about how we age, why we age, all that kind of stuff. Uh, even what is aging, you know? And I, I just never could agree with anybody. I, I felt like, you know, they didn't have the background that I did with you know, statistical theory and <clears throat> logic and just common sense, kind of like an experimental design and things like that. Uh, and my understanding of genetics and gene expression and stuff like that. So. I, I was able to put together my own ideas and disagree with everybody, but they were still like, I couldn't, couldn't figure out ways to uh, fulfill my ideas. Okay. For, for starters, I've never believed that aging was something that was caused by the environment. Mm. Okay? Well, it, environment is a cause of aging, but the, the, I'm, I'll come back to this. There's a reason why it shouldn't be causing us to age. But I decided that there had to be something like ride tickets in an amusement park. Yeah. Which, did I talk about last time? Okay. That, yeah. That, no, no, that, uh, no, it's a good analogy, though, for people, I think, to hear. Yeah. So, I'm, so okay. yeah, we have these rides on the, the, the we have a certain amount of uh, replications of our DNA that we can go through before we reach the Hayflick limit, basically. Yes. So, so my question was always, well, what are these ride tickets? Where are they? And so when I heard a guy named Calvin Harley talk about telomeres in 1993, uh, and he talked about how they shortened every time a cell divided, I said, this is it. This is the only thing that's ever occurred, and still the only thing that's ever occurred that could explain these ride tickets. So I just jumped ship from where I was doing cancer research, heart disease research, inflammation research, and I just jumped ship and started working with him on aging. And... As far as I'm concerned, I'm still working on cancer, heart disease, inflammation. It's just because they're all caused by aging. Yep. Um, but uh, uh, the real cause, let me come back to what I said before. The, the real cause of aging is, the first. let's say the first step of aging is wear and tear from all kinds of things. All the hallmarks of aging, except one, is, is, is really examples of wear and tear. Uh, environments wear and tear, things you do to your body, smoking, bad habits, bad lifestyle, bad genetics, all these things cause wear and tear. But why would that cause us to age? Okay, because we have other cells that can always divide to replace the worn and torn cells. Okay, so that's that always bothered me. And that's why when I first heard and I, I heard about it in the 1970s, but it was discovered in the 1960s by Leonard Hayflick that our, our cells can only divide a limited number of times. And I said, well, that's gotta be it. Okay, mm -hmm. so why they only lim divided a limited number of times, I didn't know, but I knew now that's why we age because cells can no longer replace the, uh, the lost worn and torn cells when when needed and so um the thing was we could either solve all the thousands of things that cause wear and tear which is what most scientists are doing one at a time you know and that's why it's going to take a gazillion years before mm. we cure aging. or we could solve that one problem exactly. of why can't our cells replace the worn and torn cells indefinitely and if we could solve that problem i believe we would totally stop aging. <clears throat> so Hayflick limit, I learned about Leonard Hayflick. Question was why? That's why I came up with these ride tickets at an amusement park. How could a how could a cell have a mechanism that could keep track of how many times it has divided? How many times does it have can it divide still? I mean uh, how many times left did it have to divide? <clears throat> so I mean thinking about everything I know about 
biochemistry and the biology, biology of a cell, how could a cell count? You know, how could a cell know? And ride tickets in an amusement park was the only way that made sense. And then when I heard about telomeres and I realized there's those ride tickets, that's been my obsession ever since. So I, I, I went to work with this guy who talked about it. I, they, they, they had told me that he had told me that they'd been working for years trying to figure out ways of preventing telomere shortening or lengthening telomeres. They had zero success. <clears throat> and I, I just was pretty bold. And I just said, let me come and work for you and I'll, I'll have it figured out in three months. <laughs> I probably said this before at the last thing, but I, I had already been a major player in the development of many biotech breakthroughs, like human growth hormone, tissue plasminogen activator, beta serum, thrombomodulin, osteoinductive factor, on and on. I'm wow. I'm a inventor of many cancer drugs, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, heart disease drugs, uh, and <clears throat> as a result. I, I became well known back then as somebody that was making things happen when nobody else could make it happen. So he 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 hired me practically on the spot, probably shortest job interview ever. And he didn't believe I'd have it in three months, but yeah, three months later I had discovered that the enzyme telomerase was the thing that was uh, the was preventing our telomeres from shortening in our reproductive cells. Yeah. Okay. And I, I should, I, let me go back to that. Okay. So <clears throat> the first really big concern was if cells only have a limited number of times they can divide, why is it our children who come from our reproductive cells are born younger than we are? Mm. They're, you know, why, why did there, why, how come this number of cell divisions is reset with them? What's not reset, it's never, there's never counted. There's no counting. They, they, they don't lose the count. So like, like every time a cell divides in our reproductive cells, which is also called our germline cells, there is no ticket ripped off, okay? So they have unlimited number of cells. So, so why is that? And so I led the research that discovered the enzyme telomeres. I worked with a team of people. I was actually the person that, that figured out that was hands-on identified it, but I, I can't I can't say that I did it alone. I worked with a team of people mm -hmm. who gave me the data to analyze. And uh, <clears throat> but we discovered this enzyme telomerase, and then we put it into normal skin cells grown in a petri dish, and showed that they divided indefinitely. Wow! Became so we, we called it immortal, but they weren't really immortal, but the scientific definition of immortal just suddenly meant overcoming the hate Yeah, They could divide and divide and divide, but if you poured acid into the Petri dish, they die. Yep. So they aren't really immortal. But, uh, so, so then um, we also, like the same, practically same week, um, I also did an, a, an experiment where I produced what I called the antisense of telomerase. And I put that into cells and I showed that it killed every cancer cell. Mm. Killed the cancer cells by essentially making them die of old age. So the telomeres would shorten on the uh, cancer cells, which yeah. is the problem with well, cancer cells. They, they don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, so so Geron Corporation decided there's a quicker return on investment by curing cancer than curing aging. Yeah. And uh, um, <clears throat> even though I argued that uh, it would never cure cancer because by inhibiting telomerase, you're going to get the telomeres really short. It's going to make the mutation rate skyrocket and the cancers are always going to come back. And stronger, uh, probably. Yeah. And and that, right, harder to fight. And that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did, invent, I did invent three different drugs that are in clinical studies now um, that uh, inhibit telomerase to fight the cancer. And, and in the clinical studies, they're finding that the cancers do always come back. Yeah. Mm, because... And that's the problem with chemo in general, isn't it? Yeah, but but when they decided to focus totally on cancer and stop aging, even though their name Geron was short for gerontology, which is study of aging, they, they decided to quit working on aging. I I left and started Sierra Sciences to, to focus on the anti-aging. And a few other scientists did the same thing, like Dr. Michael West and uh, others. They, they, they went on to pursue the aging 
instead of the cancer. Um, and so, so I've been now focused for the last 23 years on trying to find a way to in, produce telomerase in all of our cells, not just our reproductive cells. Oh, and I forgot to mention, Dr. So one of the scientists that I was working with after I left Jerome, he grew skin, human skin on the back of a mouse. Oh, yes, Ron DePino. Is that what that... Oh, well, this, this was first Walter Funk. Oh, yes, yep, yep. Walter Funk, he, he grew skin on the back of a mouse. He treated with telomerase and showed with every measurement, me method of measurement imaginable that the skin age reversed. And he was able to reverse the aging of skin on that human skin grown on the back of a mouse. Now, contrary to popular belief, mice do not age like humans. Okay. No, they don't. They, age telomeres, telomeres and telomeres have nothing to do with mice aging. But Dr. Rhonda Pennell created an engineered mouse that did age by telomer shortening. <clears throat> and then when he treated those mice with telomeres, they had what he quoted as a remarkable reversal of the aging process in an interview he did with Diane Sawyer on the news. I don't know if Diane Sawyer is well known in, in New Zealand. No, I've watched the interview though. It was fascinating to, to a see those mice. Very famous news broadcaster here in the United States. Yeah. And but uh uh you know, I thought, well, God, it's not gonna be any trouble to find funding at all. And I, I was able to find funding long before the Ron DePinnell experiment. I I ended up finding investors, everybody, you know, I was national inventor of the year for my cancer research. I did all these, I have so many clinical studies that I've been participating in and things like that. So I didn't have any trouble finding investors, but investors invest in the person, not the business. And all the investors looked at me as a way to make a lot of money. Mm. So they, instead of having me do what I want to do, they had me do what they want to do. And that was come, try to come up with products that would make, make them money. An investment. And then when we succeeded at doing that, first thing they want to do is sell the company. It just was a nightmare. The system doesn't work. Okay? Yep. I, one of the investors, I, I guess I shouldn't mention names of investors and stuff like that. One of the investors engineered, who was very interested in me doing the research I wanted to do, engineered a plan on how I was able to take over the entire company and become 100% owner. And now I am 100% owner. Right. But I decided there was no way in the world I was going to do let traditional investors get back. I yep. didn't want return financial return on investment to, to overwhelm the humanitarian science. reverse yep. on, yep. return on investment. And so, so, so I started, so I've been focusing on getting products on the uh, market by other companies. So I go to market partners. I started getting go to market partners instead of investors. I would license our discoveries to them. They would put it on the market and and uh, create products. And two of those companies are in New Zealand. Okay, that's One Truth 818 and Defy Time. Um, but I also uh, developed uh, relationships with other go to market partners like Isagenix and the sale and about it, Labella and a few others. <clears throat> and so they would sell the products, then I would get a royalty, and I would use that to fund my research, and I had complete control of the research. So that that was that solved that. That's problem. brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. because you you need to be the freedom of having, because yeah. you, you yours is a, a mission to save billions of lives and to you know slow the the hands of time and and to reverse aging, which is the biggest problem we have on the planet besides all the wars and stuff but if you look at just the fact that we're all aging we're all dying this is the biggest <laughs> frontier that there is in my opinion and why isn't everybody focusing on this because if we can most people think we can't stop aging we can't reverse it we can't when i talk about to people about anti-aging they think it's a skin cream and they don't understand that we have the scientists like yourself now that are actually doing stuff that is you know, going to give us the ability to live, well, we, however long. I mean, you can still get run over by a bus, but you, 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 you don't have to age, and and most importantly, you don't have to have this horrible decline. And that's within our grasp now, if you can get to focus on the research and get the funding for the research, you know, so that you can stay purely on that. So I totally get that model, and that it is a problem, you know, um, when investors get involved. 
the go-to-market partners were never able to produce the amount of funding that I did have. But I, I kept thinking, just bring in more and more and more, yeah. and I'll get more. Uh, and then uh, the COVID pandemic st started, and that hurt all their businesses, and my mm. funding plummeted. I've been still trying to get more go-to-market partners, but <clears throat> I have not been. And then one of the key ones, uh, the founder of uh, Isagenics, passed away suddenly, and unexpectedly and uh, then I lost the royalties from that because the company the company reorganized and decided that they were going to focus on on <clears throat> a lot less expensive products okay because it costs a lot of money to produce a what I call telomerase inducers okay and so isogenics was selling a product called isogenesis that um, and so was the sale they were selling a product called premier that, that actually was nutraceuticals that would get inside your cell, induce the production of telomerase and lengthen telomeres. Um, and I, I've got to come back and explain yeah. why I got a lot younger because of that. But <clears throat> the, uh, uh, it was just expensive to make those products. And you know, you've so like screened, like, well, last time I heard in the last interview, I think 600,000 molecules, both nutraceuticals and drug. Um, yeah. based products that that you've looked at all of these molecules for tel telomerase activity and you've actually found 900 odd of these um yeah so far we've found 900 uh not counting the nutraceuticals but that's we, we found maybe 50 at the most now nutraceuticals that will do it but i was i said i'd come back to why even though these products are lengthening telomeres why aren't people getting a lot younger. <clears throat> and that's because aging is like a tug of war going on inside your body, okay? And let's focus just on telomeres. You've got a tug of war where if you have, like in your reproductive cells, you have a tug of war where you have people pulling on a rope that are gonna cause your telomeres to shorten. And then you also have people pulling on the other side that are causing your telomeres to lengthen. <clears throat> in our reproductive cells, that tug of war is a tie, okay? The lengthening and the shortening is the same, so the telomeres don't change in length. But as soon as we are conceived, okay, we lose all the people on the side that are pulling the length in our telomeres. Telomeres completely shuts off. Now it's just a one-sided tug of war, and they pull up. Now, <clears throat> the uh, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add people back to the side to pull but I haven't been able to add enough to win the tug of war, okay? Just slow it down, <clears throat> okay? And so that's what the products that are on the market right now by all the different companies, they are slowing down, even though they're lengthening telomeres. So what happens during, during a cell division, telomeres shorten and then they lengthen. They shorten and then they lengthen, okay? So <clears throat> they are still shortening. Now we're just lengthening a little bit back. Yeah. Shorten again, they lengthen a little bit back, but they're still losing that tug of war. They're just losing slower. What I want to do is I want to continue my research to find something that wins that tug. Of war. And I mean, you talked to with Liz, Liz Parrish, okay, <clears throat> and she is yeah. running a company right now that is focused on gene therapy, that is is now a way to lengthen the telomeres, okay, to win that tug of war. To actually win. Like yes. to actually 100% put back on what you're losing yeah. so that you're staying same and even growing telomeres? Well, Link. right. Yeah, but she, she's actually, she could. The problem is the dose. How much dose do you use? How, delivery to all the cells, things like that. Yep. And, and it, in, in my clinical protocols that I've written up for this, it, it, to, to get that right dose and to get the most number of cells uh, treated as possible, it's essentially cost would cost me one million dollars per dose. Okay, yep. and just people haven't come forward with that amount of money. I can't tell you how many families I know who had relatives with Alzheimer's that were like billionaires that decided not to get treated with this gene therapy because they'd rather wait and see if it worked on somebody else, and then their relative with Alzheimer's died. In the meantime, and it's yep. just like crazy, but it's like it was an opportunity, but still we, we were never able to raise the funding to do that. But, you know, 
I don't want to be somebody that cures just the wealthy. I want no. to cure it. And so my focus has been on trying to develop a nutraceutical or pharmaceutical that will only cost 10 cents to treat a person. And so that's, that's the 900, the 600,000 different chemicals I screened. Most of those were designed. So we started with random chemicals. We found a lot that worked. None of them won the total war, but we, we started designing them so they would get better and better and better. And we started extrapolating and found out that we were really only one to three years away from having something that would be as potent as the gene therapy. Wow. Wow. But then pandemic hit and everything like that. And we lost the funding. So we're still, we're still looking for that funding. And really. <laughs> so anyone, any billionaires agents, out there listening, please. <laughs> yeah, well, been, the biggest mission on the planet. And I think it's probably more important than going to Mars or something. Um, this is this is what you should be investing in because this I've is been, going to change I've been all of us. Talking to them forever, but yeah. you know, they all want control. Yeah. They want eight percent ownership of the company. They they want to they want to make quick return on investments, even though they're bil they're billionaires. I I don't they understand. Want, it. They want I more of understand. more and more and more. Yeah, instead of actually inv in, investing in this mission for hum humankind. And actually, I, you know, I've probably turned down investments from more billionaires than anybody in the world. Okay. Yep. Just because I know from all my experience, been there, done that. I'm never going to get it cured if I have an investor that's controlling the science. Yep. So I'm, absolutely. I need to be in control of the science. And I, I just know that in one to three years, if I could do it. And what I estimate is <clears throat> it's probably going to, in the business plans that I have, which I don't call business plans because they're not geared towards return on investment, uh, financial return on investment, at least. I call them strategic plans. <clears throat> so my strategic plans show that with $113 million, I could have a drug that would totally reverse aging, cure Alzheimer's, cure muscular dystrophy, cure uh, ALS, cure multiple sclerosis, all these things in three years okay at the max so what it's it actually when i extrapolate i'm really good at math and statistics mm -hmm. and things i can ex extrapolation i can show that the really 99 percent limits are one year to three years yep. okay and so i just need to find you've got it, the it, track it, record to know it <laughs> that's the yeah. funny thing yeah and, and it's yeah I, i've got a track record of showing that i can make things done get get things done when nobody else can over and over and over again. Um, and I'm also been well known for somebody that is really good at budgeting time and expense. So I can tell you how much it costs, how, when it'll be done. And if if the money is provided, it gets done at the cost that I said it would, I said it would cost and the amount of time I said it would take. Wow. And it's just the most frustrating thing ever. It's like I'm sitting here. I've got a 10,500 foot lab facility right behind and the wall behind me is just beautiful labs, fully equipped. And they're practically ghost towns right now because I can't come up with the funding to get the research done. Yeah, and, and this is- All to those entertaining pretend scientists that have mm -hmm. something that they promote that really is not gonna cure aging at all. It's, it's gonna just maybe reverse one small part of the aging process. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, but whatever. Yeah, and so. uh, you know, uh, it, it, the thing is, like people uh, in the the way that we go after in modern medicine, we go after single diseases. But really, this is going upstream of that and looking at the whole reason we get all of these uh, diseases. And I, I wanted to discuss with you because this is a, um, a, a something that keeps coming up with telomerase is an enzyme that that helps lengthen the telomeres. And there was, because of the, your research actually into the anti-cancer um, drugs that you you invented, the rumor has come about that telomerase um, can induce cancer or could cause cancer. Why is that, couldn't be further from the truth? Well, it's because of hearsay. It's because of famous scientists that are famous, most not because of their science, but because they are on the news a lot. Yeah, like they know or, how to market. Nobel Prize winners, so Nobel Prize winners that really 
don't understand why they got the Nobel Prize to begin with. You know, that that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, they, they, they say what sounds right, okay? And yes, <clears throat> 85 or 95% of all cancers produce telomeres, okay? Why? Because they want their aging cured too, okay? So <clears throat> the telomeres didn't cause the cancer. Cell first becomes a cancer by mutation. There's a thousand, hundred thousand different ways of causing a mutation that's going to turn a normal cell into a cancer cell. But that cancer cell is going to age just like anybody else ages. And because it's dividing faster, it's going to age and die of age sooner. So, <clears throat> but because the telomeres get really short as the cells are starting to divide really fast, the mutation rates skyrocket. Short telomeres cause mutation rates at higher rates than practically anything else, except direct radiation or something. <clears throat> so the mutations in these cancers cause all kinds of varieties to occur in the cancers. And some of these cancer cells end up figuring out a way to produce telomeres on their own. <clears throat> and it's usually by a mutation or a chromosome rearrangement, suddenly one of those cancer cells is producing telomerase, all of the other cancer cells die of old age, but that one cancer cell grows back and comes back. And that's that's when you get an immortal cancer and that's the problem. But it's it was the lack of telomerase that caused the cancer to begin. In with. the first place, yep. The lack of telomerase that caused telomerase to be produced. And if those cells had already produced telomerase, they would have never become cancer to begin with and they would have never been able to fight the chemotherapies that exist or the immune system. Uh, our number one defense against cancer is our immune system. And yeah. our immune system is really good at it. But because of the mutation rates that occur in cancers, they can always find ways to evade the immune system. And that's the big tragedy. <clears throat> now, there is a really good video on my website. It's called Tokyo 2017. I spoke, <clears throat> I spoke for almost an hour just on why telomerase doesn't cause cancer. In fact, telomerase decreases the risk of cancer. <clears throat> I spoke for an hour. Mm -hmm. That was because the reason why I did this was I, I speak at continuing medical education conferences a lot. And there was a very high profile continuing medical education lecture that I was giving with four other doctors <clears throat> in Tokyo in 2017. And the night before, maybe two nights before my presentation, somebody got all over the news saying that telomerase causes cancer. <clears throat> and, and it was gonna like, here, here are already hundreds, maybe a thousand doctors had already signed up to listen to me talk. I, I was really surprised because from the airport to the hotel, I saw billboards with my picture on. Okay? Wow. So this was a really high profile presentation, but <clears throat> Suddenly, everybody's rumors going around, oh, telomerase caused cancer. What's this Bill Andrews guy trying to do? So I spent all night rewriting my presentation. Oh. And so instead of being like 45 minutes long, it went an hour and 20 minutes long because about an hour I spend going over all the data, everything about why there's such a rumor, things like that. I strongly encourage people to listen to it I, I've said it so many times, I know exactly the time. If they start watching at the 25 video minutes. On my website called Tokyo 2017, <laughs> it starts at 25 minutes and 25 seconds <laughs> where I say, okay, I'm going to go off on a tangent and talk about this rumor. And it, it goes to a little over an hour before I finally get back to the main the subject. Excerpt. Excerpt. But that, that excerpt, it's, it's, it's maybe for So that minutes. puts that rumor to bed. And so anybody who wants, we will put the links in there because we want to put that one to bed because we need to move on from that. Uh, and, and it's the shortening of telomeres. Otherwise, why would we get a whole lot more cancers, Alzheimer's, all of these things when we're old? We don't get them at 10, right. 20, usually. Usually there's some childhood cancers that are the exceptions, but... Generally, we get these things, they are diseases of aging. And that's partly because the telomerase, telomeres have shortened and are causing the reading of the DNA, from what, how I understand it, to be faulty and cause these mutations in the, in the DNA. 
Um, exactly, exactly. You, you just described it very well. I can go into more details about how it changes the cell to, to give off declining aging, not just uh, 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 organ failure. But uh, it's, it's, it, there's videos on my website too, where I go into great detail explaining that. In fact, I, I encourage you, there's videos on how we age, why we age, what aging is, and how to, and, and how not to age. <laughs> And with, um, with, with telomeres, because, you know, we've got these, well, I don't know how many years now, 12, 14 uh, hallmarks of aging, it keeps changing. Um, but at the basis is telomere attrition because everything else is sort of, uh, well, we have to cure that one first in order to affect the other things. The others are, are mostly inflammation, oxidation, sort of uh, uh, downstream effects. I think the immune system is another one that, we'll, like we in our company, Avum, we're going after the immunosenescent story to try to. But again, we have to solve the telomere problem if we're going to actually influence the rest of them. Would you Would you agree with that? That's exactly what well, what I said before about wear and tear. Um, all but telomere shortening is one of the hallmarks of aging. All the other ones are essentially wear things that cause wear and tear, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, if we could keep the telomeres long, we wouldn't have to worry about the wear and tear because we can always replace the worn, worn and torn cells. And <clears throat> so it's like, I, you know, like uh, Rhonda Pennell, actually, this guy that I talked to about, he created those engineered mice. He actually did some other studies where he actually, uh, I can't remember if it was published or just a press release, where he actually said telomeres are the kingpin of aging. Yeah, that's a good. And, and we've done a lot of studies here looking at biomarkers of aging and stuff like that. And we show that these biomarkers all get reversed by relengthening the telomeres in, a in a human cells in a Petri dish. So it might be that everything about the hallmarks of aging could all be gone away if we would just lengthen telomeres. But that may or may not be true. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, it is very true, but the bottom line that is 100% true is that we will never cure aging unless we also solve the telomere shortening problem. Exactly. Because that's a mathematical, unquestionable, re very reproducible cause of aging that any lab in the world that works on culturing cells knows that telomeres are shortening and puts a limit on the lifespan of the cells, therefore putting a limit on the lifespan of humans. And you can mathematically calculate from that a human cannot possibly live beyond 125 years. And that's only if they have the perfect genetics and live the perfect lifestyle, which none of us do. So nobody's ever lived to be 125. But and we'll then, all live hundreds of years if we could solve the telomere shortening. Exactly. So this is the this is the, 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 the crux of it is being able. So when we go and we talk about longevity science, you know, and we're all over these NAD precursors and we're you know, activating our sirtuins and we're, uh, you know, we're living the healthy lifestyle, we're doing our exercise. All of these things are going to help us live longer and healthier to a degree, but they're all downstream sort of um, still the Band-Aid approach rather than getting to the root cause of the problem, which is at the bottom of it is telomere attrition, the shortening of these telomeres. Is, is that, and, and, and you've got telomerase and juices, like you've, like you said, you've got, We've got the gene therapies. So, you know, Liz Parrish was on last week. She's had your gene therapy done on her. And she, I mean, she's one person, but she looks phenomenal. Like she's 53 or 52 um, and, and looks like 30. Um, and I don't know whether that's just because she lives the perfect lifestyle or has she, because of these gene therapies that she's had. She's had a number of them. We don't have really enough data. I, I think the yeah. only test of curing aging is what I call the Betty White test. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Betty White passed away. So it's, I still call it the Betty White test. And that's, if, if, if we could come up with a cure for aging, and the only way to prove that it really is curing aging is to see somebody like Betty White, who everybody knows, who everybody knew, walk out on stage and look, feel, and behave like she's 25 again. Okay, and that's, I don't care about DNA methylation or glycosylation of, of uh, uh, IgG molecules yeah. in the body, D different telomere lengths, none of that 
means anything unless that person also passes the Betty White test. Okay, <clears throat> now Liz Parrish may have passed the Betty White test. Okay, she, she's looking like it. <laughs> well, you know, it's like when she first got treated, I was, I was a little worried about if it was done right and things like that. But I, I saw her at an A4M conference, <clears throat> and I was in a room, and I said, "Okay," she told me she was coming upstairs and I said, okay, I'm gonna have my eyes closed. I want you to walk in the room. And I'm gonna open my eyes and give you my first impression. <clears throat> and she did, she walked in the room, I opened my eyes and I said, oh, darn, you don't look younger, okay? But that changed that over the years afterwards, I started realizing, my God, she is, she's- She's phenomenal. She's yeah. I don't have any scientific data to support that. Okay. Well, we, so, we've got measurements of te telomeres. Uh, well, and as I said, the telomeres, you can measure the telomeres, but that doesn't pa mean you pass the Betty White test. I want to see if she passed the Betty White test. And now she doesn't look any older than she did back then when she did the treatment. And she looks younger. Every time I see her, I'm shocked. She yeah. looks younger. But I so do... does this take time? Like the genetic, you, you've done the gene therapy, but you don't like next day look like you're just been renewed. We're venturing, we're venturing into the unknown. Unknown, yeah. We don't know, okay? Uh, when Ron DePennell took, did his experiments with the engineered mice, it took three weeks. Maybe it takes three months with humans before you start seeing anything. And maybe it's a slow pro progress. But <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to encourage people to support Liz Parrish and yeah, her company. Me too. Mm. Because, you know, I do research, but I don't really market anything. I go to market partners. I don't market anything. I think I think the real the cure for aging is going to come from everything Liz Parrish is going to do. She just needs more funding, more help. And believe me, if if she gets funding, <laughs> she's going to be providing me with funding to do my research because I want to make certain that everything I discover goes into her hands and 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 gets treated. And so, she's so uh, courageous. Like she like um the, the the courage that it takes to be the first human to take these things, you know, and to experiment on your own body. And I really think it's like the power of a, a mother because a mother who wants to fix her own child. Uh, and I, and I get that because like, you know, like I'm, I'm about the same. <laughs> so not my child, it's my mom. Um, you know, like whatever it takes. And it takes people that are motivated like that to put their own bodies on the line to, to, for the good of humanity, the good of science, and in this case, hopefully, you know, the good of a son and eventually. Because it, once again, if we can cure these things, we're going to have an impact on childhood diseases and genetic mutations and all these sorts of things that some kids are born with. And um, it's all going to have massive downstream effects. And so what I don't understand is why the hell is not everybody investing in these types of things now, the ones who can't, you know, like the billionaires of the world, it, it, or is there something, you know, like, do we not want to fix this? Like, if I said to you, we can cure cancer tomorrow, uh, everyone would be like, yeah, let's do it. You say, yeah. you, you, let's cure aging. And they're like, well, but get off the grass, you know, like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but, Why but do we have that? Cancer, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, aging, all these things will not be cured tomorrow. It's going to take a few years. And the investors don't want to wait a few years mm. before getting a return on investment. That's why cancer is not cured, is because every great scientist that has ever existed that decided to try to raise money to pursue their idea on how to cure aging, the investor steered them in a different direction mm. and also had them sign non-compete contracts mm. and then took control, sold the companies out from under them after they had success at doing the other things. It's just, just a disaster. I, I know these people. I have lots of friends that are all interested in curing all these things. They've all did not succeed at what they wanted to do because the investor took control. I, I What I say all the time is investors invest in the dream, but not the dream coming true. Mm -hmm. And that is a real big problem. That's why cancer is not cured. That's why heart disease is not cured. 
there's so many people out there super passionate about doing all this stuff, but you know, curing these diseases, but they're not entertainers. They're not good at marketing themselves. Mm. They're just good at doing science and investors just take advantage of them. And it's, and the entertainers also take advantage, pretend, enter, pretend entertainers, scientists. They, yep. they take advantage of everybody else by steering all the right people in the wrong directions. Yep. You know? yep. And you see, when you've been in the space a long time and you've been, you know, you, you follow everybody, you know, you can see it over and over again. Um, the famous ones, you know, no, no particular names here, but there's a lot of famous scientists who get garner a lot of attention who really haven't got the breakthroughs that they pretend to have or they've cornered the market, but there's other people who've got no following. They're not famous on Instagram. They're not famous on YouTube. They're not famous anything. And they've actually got all the secrets and, and they've actually got the stuff and, and it's frustrating. And even as, you know, as a little entrepreneur over here in New Zealand, I know like with our uh, company, you know, I, 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 I fight to maintain control of the company the, because when you control it, I control the destiny of the company. When you have an outside investors come in, it's not easy because you you reach a point where you're you're stuck. You keep reaching this uh, upper glass ceiling, if you like, where you it's a struggle to break through. But you either sort of sell your soul or you don't sell your soul. <laughs> you know, but it's very hard to keep control and keep a control of your vision as well at the same time. Um, and it's a struggle, I think, everywhere in business. You know. Let me say a few more things about Liz Parrish because I truly believe she's the future. She's the secret. Okay. And what one is is she's the original biohacker. Okay. Now there people have done biohacking before, but she made biohacking famous by the fact that she went ahead and treated herself to do this thing and made you know worldwide renown. Uh, not, uh, everybody in the world became aware of it. But <clears throat> And and now everybody's doing biohacking and they're all doing it all wrong and they're 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 trying they're trying to fake it. They're saying, oh, I got younger by these biomarkers and things like that. There's some famous people making a lot of money, even some billionaires claiming to have reversed their aging. But they look no younger to me at all. They have not passed the Betty White test at all. Uh, the other thing about Liz Parrish is she's not a scientist but she knows more about the science of aging than most scientists in the field. That's truly amazing. Okay, I, I can talk with Liz Parrish about science and I just can't believe how well she understands what I'm saying and how well she communicates it. Mm. One other thing, <laughs> I can go up there. She is so passionate about people being happier and healthier that she's now started a campaign. She probably talked to you about this, but where she, here, here's a real problem, okay? Somebody's got a disease that's terminal, okay? But they have a disease that just makes life not worth living, okay? Those people should be able to get treated with anything they want to try, okay? But the rules in all countries, including the United States, don't allow it, okay? And so there's, like, you know, I've heard stories even from you. Yeah, from okay, me, my dad. Being in, being in so having a patient in the hospital, you know what to do to treat that patient, but the hospital refuses to do it. Okay, that's wrong. Okay, so Liz Parrish went ahead and got a master's degree just to pursue that problem. Yeah. And she did her thesis on something she called best choice medicine. And it's all about changing the whole system so that the patients can choose those patients that I just mentioned who are terminal or have a disease not worth living, they can choose whatever they want, okay? <clears throat> so after she got her master's degree, and I, I actually read her master's uh, thesis, I was blown away with how good it was. I mean, how does a person with her background know so much about science and business? And, <clears throat> but the- uh, um, He's curious. Uh, she, wanted to, she wanted to make a, turn into a publication. And so I co-wrote an art article with her and it's now published in a peer review journal uh, <clears throat> that's called Best Choice Medicine. The title's a little bit longer, but you can 
search for it with my name and her name, find the paper, uh, abbreviated BCM, but she is on a mission now to make it. She's not just trying, she, she's not interested in making money, either am I, okay? Our goals are to make everybody happy and healthier. She's on this mission to really get best choice medicine pushed through the government. Yeah. She was, she's trying to get me to speak a lot more on it, but I'm so busy with the science. I can't do it, but I wish I could uh, because I support it so much, but she's, she's not giving up. She's the pioneer. Yeah. She, when, and I want to join her in that fight. I mean, down here, because I, I wanted to fight when, when my dad died and my, my people know my story. And I shared that with on Liz's interview, actually. Um, I want to get the rules changed so that you have the right to try, you know, I called it the right to try, but it, it, it's the best choice. You should have the choice that if you, if you're at the end of the road and there's no other options and you've got something that, that could or may not work um, and it's not voodoo crazy, um, why can't you do that? Why can't you have a go? Why couldn't I put intravenous vitamin C into my dad who was dying and yeah. they were telling me, um, it'll damage his kidneys. That was their argument. It'll damage his kidneys. I'm like, hmm, I think being dead damages the kidneys too. <laughs> you know, yeah, there was Taylor, the logic in that one. <laughs> Taylor Swift was just uh, like picked as the Times person of the year. Like someday Liz Parrish is going to be that person. She's also <laughs> yeah, going to be a little bit everything like that. So yeah. I'm counting on her. Yeah, I, uh, I, and and I I've, uh, I think all the way I'm supporting her. I wish I could go and get the gene therapies right, you know, <laughs> right now. But these are, and and people say, well, they're only for rich people. And yeah, that's where it starts. And and uh, it's or it starts with people like Liz who make stuff happen, and then they they get they make it happen. Um, but it will be democratized over time if we can get if we can scale. We've got to scale all of these things. We've got to start somewhere, you know, rich. The rich will save the poor, is yep. what I always say. If, yep. if we could get, if Liz Stats. Parrish and I could get these clinical studies done to the level that we want them to, the proof of concept that would come out of that, when people saw, if people, if we could have treated Betty White with the gene therapies that Liz Parrish is doing at the right doses and the right ways and all the test measurements, and she walked out on stage looking 25, believe me, the prices of the gene therapy would drop research to develop other forms of doing the exact same thing that gene therapy does, but cheaper would skyrocket and <clears throat> we'd all be living in a whole better world. Yeah. 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 This is a whole different subject. There's people that believe it's going to make the world worse. Oh yeah. Well, that's where well, yeah, I've discussed that one on the show too. And that, you know, like we will come up, like you talked about the other day, um, Sir David At Attenborough, you know, like yes. what, he's at, I think, 96 or something now. And he is a treasure trove of experience and information and uh, knowledge and IQ reputation. Of 10, yeah. He's, it's like amazing person. We can't lose him. We can't lose him. We shouldn't lose him. And is it shouldn't have lost Betty White. We shouldn't have yeah. lost Betty White. We shouldn't have yeah. lost Michael Jackson. We shouldn't have lost Whitney Houston. We, there's so many people. Nice people. Yep. I mean, some of them would have had, didn't die from aging, but but there's still lengthening telomeres would have helped all of them. Okay, uh, and we preserve had... that knowledge base when we don't die. Like I said to Liz, like I'm 55. It's taken me a hell of a lot of time to get to the level that I'm at now, which is not amazing, but it's where it is. I've got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, a lot of, and what I meant to start declining now. You're 71. You've come to the pinnacle of 72, where you're at. 72. 72. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got all this incredible experience. Are you meant to start declining it now? What, what a what loss to the world. And then those brains that can, can maintain those brains, that's going to come to the good of let's work out the big problems that we do have. And the population is going to decline. I mean, fertility rates are dropping through the floor. Um you know, we're not replacing ourselves. You, you talked briefly about your dream for robotic support for care, uh, for caregiving because we were talking about caregiving. Oh, I haven't even talked about that yet. Oh, God. <laughs> Wait, we're going to, this is going to last forever. I hope you're available. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to have you on here, you know, regularly yeah. because there are topics that we could cover in depth and go can into I, the deeper I, to the science. Can I just spend a minute talking about this? 
robotic care data that you just mentioned. Okay, so, so most of the world doesn't know this. Japan is probably the country most aware of it. Mm. But um, we are, in the next few years, we are going to have so many people on the planet needing caregiving, mostly because of the baby boomers. So many people on the planet needing caregiving that we're not going to have enough people to take care of them. Okay, we're talking about way, way before 2050. Okay, <clears throat> and more like 2030. It's it's a urgent, urgent problem. It's called the silver tsunami. Okay, I speak about it a lot at continuing medical education conferences. We have to come up with a solution. I always say, well, the solution is to cure aging. That's not happening fast enough. We are going to be building and building and building a big mountain of people needing caregiving and nobody to take care of. Yep. So what I want to do is I want to see a lot of money invested, put into developing robotic systems for caregiving and have them in house because yeah. you and I have both been at assisted living homes, hospices, nursing homes. People are very unhappy, very depressed being there because they're not with their families. We need to develop robotic in-house robotic systems that care for the patients provide them entertainment, provide them food, provide them medication, pro take them to the toilet, all this kind of stuff. So, and in home so the family can come and see them and enjoy them and not have to worry about how miserable taking care of them is. It, it's, I've seen so many people's plugs pulled because the relatives couldn't couldn't take take it anymore. They yep. couldn't, they, they reached the breaking point of taking care of it. Relative. I mean, I've been there. I've, you know, yeah, like I've lived it. House robotic caregiving is essential. We yep. got to get people going. I don't care if I ever make a penny off of it, but I want to move, get movement towards that. I see yep. a lot of robotic companies, but I don't see anybody focusing on this silver tsunami and caregiving problem. Yeah. And, you know, like um, I've been caregiving, you know, for eight years and, you know, the last three years intensively. Um, and, it's a 24 seven job and it, you know, you know, Bill, I'm pretty tough, right? I'm, I'm an ultra marathon. I know how to push and I know how to push hard, but there have been times where I have been absolutely broken because I'm not sleeping. You know, you're at the for, for, for weeks and months on end, you're fighting in the medical system every day for your loved one. You are fighting to keep them at home. You are researching 24 seven sometimes to try to find the thing that you've missed. To well, say I applaud you. I think you're amazing because I think caregiving is the noblest of all professions, especially when you volunteer doing it. Okay. And it, it is, it's like so important. And I mean, it's like there's so many people and the caregiving facilities that exist now, they don't they don't have enough money to pay proper people. And so elder abuse is so common in these things. And and it's 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 just a problem that we have to solve. And funding for caregiving has to be the top priority. And uh, right now. Uh, robotics is one of the main places that funding should go. And, and, and while we wait for that to be developed, caregivers need to be paid more. It needs to be, caregiving needs to be a, a profession that more people want to go do and, 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 I and mean, the, the, yep. the do it can be selective in who they pick to be the caregivers. Yep. And, and, you know, like I know there's nothing, there's nobody that comes to help and there's, I have to pay if I need an hour off you know, and, uh, you know, I've got two younger brothers that, you know, one of them's taken mum for an hour now so that I can do this interview. But that's the the daily, you know, thing that you have to manage all of those things. And that means that I'm not as effective as I would like to be because I can't travel. I can't go to all these amazing conferences. I can't, you know, pop over to Reno and see you, you know, all of those sorts of things that, but I do that willingly, you know, that that's that's what you do and that's what you should do. Um but it, it does mean I, that it, I'm not being as effective, right? You know? Can I say one other thing that's kind of like, kind of sound odd, but, you know, Liz Parrish and I have been very vocal, saying all these kind of things all over the place, and we're not getting anywhere. But a very famous person one time said, you're never a prophet in your own hometown. Yeah. I think he said, <laughs> you're never a prophet in your own village, okay? Well, you are not, 
part of my hometown. You are in New Zealand. I'm in the United States. I'm hoping that, and I hope that Liz is thinking the same thing. You could help promote help us by promoting what we're saying elsewhere besides our own hometown. Okay, yep. so so I'm counting on you. I think you are the secret. I think Liz is the secret. I think I think we all have to work together, and I think you could be a major help in getting all this stuff done. And so spread the word to. I'm on the team. I'm on the Australia, team. Australia, <laughs> all this place. Is good. Yeah, it is not my hometown. <laughs> and it is like inch by inch, you know, like, yeah, I'm not Elon Musk and I'm not Joe Rogan and I'm not, you know, but uh, when when we as, you know, little people, if you like, start to all get together and start to talk about this and start to share that, we, we can create these ground swells of movement, you know, and if we're all in it with the passion that you and I and Liz share, um, you can overcome things. I mean, we when I looked back at my running career, the first time I ran a, hundred, a, a 10K race, my very, very first 10K race, I failed at the 5K mark. You know, I had to pull out with an asthma attack. Now, if I'd gone, oh, well, I'm a hopeless runner, I'm never going to run again, um, you know, I wouldn't have, you know, done all these hundreds of ultra marathons all around the world and had all the adventures that I'd had. So you've got to start small, you know, and you've got to just keep plugging and and not give up and not go, oh, who am I to, you know, who am I to be doing this? You know, because it, you, you have those voices in your head, but you've got to overcome that and and keep getting and build a team around you of people that are doing it. And one skill that I have is sharing these stories and interviewing amazing people and getting it out there and, you know, doing, I'm never going to be a scientist like you, but um, I can interview the scientists. <laughs> you're 500 years old, you'll be the top scientist in the world. Who knows? <laughs> Think about think of the opportunities that exactly provides. I mean, in a lot of my videos, I, I show this picture of of uh, um, when first contact from Star Trek first yeah, contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. And, and, and you're I always the, say, the, I say I'm not afraid of dying. I, I wouldn't be an ultra marathon runner if I was afraid of dying. Right? There's there's too many cliffs to fall off and things. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> but why is it to die? I'm I'm afraid of missing out, and so I always say. I, I show this picture of, you know, with the, the I forget the actors' names, but I'm now no both. On of Star them. Trek. <laughs> and, but they, they shake hands, the Vulcan and the American human shake hands. And I always say, when that happens, I want to be there. And all of a sudden I appear there as a three-way handshake. And that's 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 it for me. I'm I want to be there. I want to be there when we find life and intelligent, um, uh, intelligent life on other planets. I want to be there when we find non-intelligent life on other planets. But I also want to, when, when the origin of the universe and all of that gets figured out, I want yeah. to be there. Yeah. Okay. So it's curing it. And, you know, I'm, it's been an obsession my whole life. I'm, I'm working. And I'd love to write a book if I had more time to write, but I'd, I'd love to do a book on something like curing aging. The what, why, how, and how not of aging, you know, yep. and also, and why is it taking so long, you know? And it, it's all that kind of stuff. It's like I could say so much, but I think these podcasts work a lot better than writing for me. They, because in, the, in in a way they do because you know, like, and I can get you on lots of other podcasts, but because you know, like when you share these stories, and everyone has their little audience and their bigger audience and their bigger audience, and slowly it starts to get the was, get the word out. You know, a podcast series. Yeah, Let's absolutely. Absolutely. On, uh, what what is aging? Then why we age and how we age? And how not deal, to age? Deal. Why? Yeah, let's do it. I'm up for it. Okay. Good. Well, right, I'll book you next week because we'll start with, with step number one, and we can you know you go deeper into the science because today we've been talking about our ultra marathoning and our this and our that and you know. But I really would like to deeply understand the science. I want to go into gene therapies. I want to understand AAV and CMV and you know all of the the deliberately and the cytotoxic T-cells and the, you know, all of that. Yeah, I mean, tell me, tell me. Not, not only does Liz Parrish know the science better, she's actually come up with a whole new gene therapy, CMV. CMV. <laughs> and I've been a, an advisor for a company. I'm just blown away with how well it, I think it's going to replace wow. AA. Really? Okay. And it's Liz Parrish's idea. Okay, so um, so this is cytomegalo. How do you say it? cytomegalovirus? Uh, cytomegalovirus, yes. As opposed to adeno, uh, the AAV, which is the delivery method. 
Yeah, ad yeah, adeno-associated virus. And that's, so that if we just talk briefly on the gene therapy, the, the way that they get the genes in, uh, the, the, the payload, if you like, into the cell is using these viruses that have been stripped of all the replicative machinery, but yeah. they allow the docking onto the cells to to deliver the pay, payload into the genes. Is that correct? Is that, is that the way yeah, you... They're essentially tamed viruses. Tamed okay? viruses, yeah. We are, we are now in control of the virus. We're just using their mechanisms to deliver things into the cells, nothing more. But the problem, the reason why the gene therapies that so far Liz has done on herself and that I'm trying to do clinical protocols are like a million dollars a dose is because adeno-associated virus, AAV, its infectivity rate is incredibly low. <clears throat> but now CMV's infectivity rate is very high and it has a lot of other advantages over AAV. And if, when, when, I don't want to say if, when Liz can get this going, to the level she wants to, that's going to make gene therapy infinitely less expensive. Really? Okay. In the payload, you'll be able to mix the genetic therapies all into the one, from what I understand? Yeah, that's that's the other benefit. She can put, AAV has a limit on how much you can package inside the virus, okay, the tame virus. CMV, its payload is way, way bigger. So you can do multiple genes at a time. It is, my, you know, this is so... Frustrating. The biggest problem with this thing is the, you know, Liz Parrish is funding universities and stuff like that to work on this. University labs, they don't have time to do this. They have too many teaching requirements. They're writing grants and stuff like that. They, they, it just, the work doesn't get done in universities. It's got to be investor funded businesses. That's the only way it's going to get done. And the investors got to stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. They can best stay out of the way, make their trillions of dollars later instead of their millions of dollars soon. Yeah, it's like I, it's just so frustrating. Liz Parrish is running into that problem. I wish, I mean, I've already told Liz Parrish that if I could get all the funding that's needed, I would do all the work that needs to develop that CMV technology that she's invented here in my company. Okay, wow. yeah, and and that's but that's. <laughs> yeah, we could talk about this has been the Liz Paris show. Not, not the <laughs> well, we're both things <laughs> for a reason, you know, because there are things like you know that we, we've got Follistatin, we've got um uh the reverse transcriptase, your your telomere gene Clotho. therapy, we've got Clotho, Clotho, which I'd love to have with mom. Um uh GC what was the other one? The GC one F. Uh, oh, GPC one alpha, GPC one yeah, sure. alpha. So mitochondrial biogenesis sort of a, a gene therapy to improve mitochondrial function. And and if we could put them all into the one and deliver that into one and make that a, an affordable, uh, approachable, you know. Uh, and, and are there any risks like with a the gene therapy? There is you know risk for cytotoxicity, cytotoxic T cell responses. Can we mitigate those sort of risks? No. With, yeah, that's my business. Okay, that's that's my expertise. Okay, so so I've been involved in a lot of clinical studies. I've seen just terrible things happen because no, I, I they they do them wrong. Doctors don't practice on humans. Other people on on animals. They practice. Other people practice on the animals, and then give it to the doctors to do on humans. They make mistakes after mistake after mistakes. And I've seen so much of this. I've written clinical protocols where I've covered all the risk factors. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why it's expensive. But cytotoxic T cell responses, that mm -hmm. is the biggest problem. I'm I'm amazed. I must have said that six years ago when we interviewed that. I've, that is, I've, I've done my research, Bill. <laughs> there are so many people that have died in clinical studies of gene therapies because of cytotoxic T cell responses, which is where your own body starts to decide that in Infected cells are now foreign cells and starts attacking your own body. Mm. I ha but the reason why these people died is because the doctors weren't prepared for it, didn't test for the possibility. And if they had tested for the possibility, they, they, they would have known exactly what to do. My clinical protocols, I've got all these written out perfectly, and I insist on being the orchestra leader. I'm not an MD, but I've been involved in a lot of clinical studies. I've seen a lot of major oops kind of problems where the doctor goes, oops, we forgot to do this or that person dies. 
I want to be an orchestra leader and where I am got a checklist and I'm making certain that every single nurse, doctor, everybody involved in those clinical studies is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing and on time so that later they don't say, oh, we forgot to do this or forgot to do that and somebody dies as a result. So the safety should not be an issue. Almost every single person that dies in a clinical study dies because the doctor made a mistake. Okay, so so. And the other problem have- with the 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 um with the gene therapies um that has come up now and again is that it integrates into the actual gene and causes not CMV cancer, and not an AD. Not, okay, that's, that's event. yeah. So lentivirus, which is greatest gene therapy of all, integrates into the chromosome and can cause cancer. Okay. Uh, and so that's why it's only used ex vivo, and my, which means they take cells out of the body, treat those cells, and then verify that those cells haven't Didn't, been yeah. integrated into the place that causes cancer, and then put those back into people. And that, gotcha. that doesn't help. But uh, so lentivirus is a great gene therapy, but it's never going to actually be a really useful one for, for treating people because of the fact that it integrates into the chromosomes and causes cancer. Yeah, and we, we've already got like um, I think it's eleven gene therapies that are approved in the states already for um, monogenic um, diseases. So this is something that's already been used for the last ten, fifteen years already. Um, but they're very, very high price tag, aren't they? What's the that? bubble boy disease was one of the very first things treated, and yep, you know, I, I kind of like was watching this, and I said, no, you can't do this. I mean, and and I I knew these kids would die. And then half of them did die from cancer. Mm. And it set gene therapy back a lot. But why were the doctors ignoring everything that all the scientists knew? Okay, any scientist that had been working on gene therapy in vitro, in cells in a petri dish, knew that these gene therapies were going to cause cancer. And the doctors went and treated these kids anyway. Okay, and the ones that didn't die of cancer did get cured. So the gene therapy did work, but it's still the price was too high. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and this has set the 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 industry back quite considerably. But now we've moved on, and we have ways to tackle those those. There's still problems. a lot of mistakes. Still a lot of mistakes being made. Still, it's just it's just it's terrible. I just mentioned, you know, animal studies is one way to go, but I don't even like. Uh, killing animals in animal no, studies. No. I, I, I think animal studies should only be done if animals are going to benefit from the treatment, you know, or have a chance of benefiting from the treatments. And and but we are talking about pet for everything, everything you and I have been talking about all day long is also true for our pets, especially dogs, cats, and horses, because we've already shown that dogs, cats, and horses age by telomere short. Where I earlier I'd mentioned that mice don't. Don't, yep. So, we won't be able to help rabbits. We won't be able to help mice because rodents don't really age by telomere shortening. They do have some variation of telomere shortening, but it's nothing like what humans have. Um, and then, you know, I, I want to do, I want to do all my preclinical studies, so animal studies on pygmy marmosets mm. because they're small, very close, really related to humans. They do age by telomere shortening, and. <clears throat> um, you know, we can tag them, treat them, let them loose, keep track them, you know, in the wild, they can live normal lives. And then we just keep track of like, how long did they live? How, how wow. did, did they die? When they do die, we find them. And what did they die of? Things like that. Wow. That'd um, be amazing. And because and, we've already worked out too, that, that things like um, lobsters and clams that live for, well, clams live up 500 years and lobsters. The aging process. They, yeah, they've already, they don't have this telomere problem, do they? Well, yeah, they, they have telomeres produced in all their cells. They have no aging. They also don't, they rarely get diseases. So everything's good, okay? They, 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 their main cause of death is predators. You know, lobsters, you know, every time they shed their shell and get a new shell, they're a little bit bigger, makes them less and less able to hide from octopus, which <laughs> is their main main. Uh, Nemesis. <laughs> and, yeah, and but muscles, you know, like you can not okay. So none of the animals have like rings on a tree, okay, that you can count, but except clams. Mm. 
clams every year, clams get a new stripe. And when people start counting these stripes, they have found clams that are over 500 years old. Crazy. Okay. And all because they have telomerase produced in all their cells. They don't have telomere shortening. They never get cancer. They never get diseases. It's just why we, why that alone hasn't made it so that in, in, in that Tokyo 2017 video, I talk a lot about that. Why that alone hasn't encouraged people to start, let's be more like lobsters. <laughs> let's be more like clams and live to 500 years and not get any of these horrible diseases. And and we've got, you know, like you said, you've got some gene induction uh, and some, some nutraceuticals and drugs that are actually out on the market now. They're not going to completely stop it. Uh, but they're going to slow the process down. So, don't you know, yeah. And I, and I want to have talked to your, your team about th those, you know, the people that you have go to market partners because um, the, not readily available still, you know, it's still like it's out on the market, but not even people know about it. And that needs to change, you know? So I don't know why they don't know about it because they're doing everything they can. Marketing is so expensive. And yeah. It is so hard. difficult to do. And even when you have something to work, yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna introduce you to a guy named Christian Chase, okay, uh, and uh, he's he's the guy to talk to. Yeah, okay. no, that's gonna be exciting. So, Doctor Bill, we we'll, we'll rebook in next week when you've got time for the for the actual science side of things, and you pick a topic and we'll 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 go for it. Um, you know. And and do a series of these things on on the actual science behind all of this, so that people can really get a deep understanding of it, and, and then get that out there in the world. Okay, that sounds absolutely brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been fun. I, I I think we've run out of things to talk about, especially now that we're talking about doing a series of podcasts. <laughs> prepared for all those. Yeah, no, that that sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I will put all the links to Sierra Sciences is the best place to have a look at, at what you're doing. Um, anywhere else that you want to direct people to uh, your books. You've got um, a couple of books out that you've, you've yeah, put no, out. I, I haven't been keeping those books available because they never sold very well. And uh, <clears throat> But uh, I, I essentially, if somebody wants to read, read it, I just send them a free uh, PDF. PDF copy. There you go. If anyone wants to never, dive never into the science. Fun. <laughs> you don't make money out of books <laughs> they're more of a uh, uh a calling card than anything else and to to share your knowledge with the world uh unless you're super famous and then you can sell lots of books but um you know it's the way of the world i think is what we've discovered today and <laughs> we've got to find ways around all the problems dr bill thank you so much for your time today thank i really you. appreciate you and i can't wait till installment number two in the saga all right.